This is the first part of my video series on converting a kayak into a wet sub. After a few dives in my old submarine, I found that it was a real hassle to operate. I had to haul it around with a trailer, find a boat ramp to launch it from, and if I wanted to get out into the ocean, I usually had to drive several miles to an inlet and then navigate through the inlet, which is usually pretty dangerous. I spent a lot of time in battery capacity reaching dive sites, which in some cases were within half a mile or so of the shore, places I could practically swim to from the beach. I needed something more mobile, so my first thought was to just build a dive scooter, but if I was going a long distance this would probably tire out my arms and it wouldn't allow me to operate on the surface either. The more appealing option seemed to be a wet sub, which is more like riding a motorcycle underwater while you're wearing scuba gear. In fact, the first example shown in the Wikipedia article was the perfect model to follow for this project. This motorized canoe was used by the British in World War II to dive underwater and plant mines on enemy ships, and if it worked for that, the same idea should work for exploring coral reefs. Here's a view of a very basic CAD model I drew up for my own design. This uses a 10-foot kayak with dive planes installed on the front and a raised front end to accommodate an air tank and then a battery and trolling motor in the back. For this project, I'll be modifying an existing kayak by cutting out certain areas and adding others with fiberglass layups. This will be easier and probably produce a much better result than a scratch-built hull. I got a Pelican 100 kayak because it was pretty cheap and had approximately the right shape. The first change I made was to cut a flap on the front end so that it could be raised up and have sidewalls fiberglassed on later. This would be necessary to accommodate the bulky scuba tank I was going to use. The kayak is made out of something called Ram X. After a little research, I discovered that's just a marketing name for a variation of high-density polyethylene. HTPE is waterproof and doesn't corrode. It's all around pretty chemically inert, but the same thing that makes it so inert also makes it difficult to bond to with adhesives. Here I've put a bead of CA glue on the hull and hit it with accelerator. After it dries, I'm able to peel it clean off the surface with very little effort. Here's another demonstration, this time using two-part epoxy. And once again, it peels clean off the surface of the polyethylene like nothing was ever there. So this is obviously really bad news if I want to do fiberglass work on the hull of the kayak. Luckily, there's a very effective trick to make adhesive spawn reliably to polyethylene. Briefly hitting the surface of the polyethylene with a blowtorch changes the chemical makeup of the polymers to accept adhesives. Now I'm not sure if it's just oxidizing the surface or actually breaking up the closed polymer chains, but either way, it's very effective as you'll see in a moment. You can clearly see now that epoxy doesn't want to go anywhere once it's cured. When I tried to separate the epoxy, I actually ended up gouging the underlying plastic, so that seems like a pretty solid bond. Okay, back to the modifications. The next thing I did was remove this panel on the backside. This is where I'll put my battery and other electronics. Next, I 3D printed these spacers as a sort of scaffolding to hold up the flap on the front end while the sidewalls get fiberglassed on. This should be enough space to fit the air tank and rudder pedals without a problem. Once the caps on the side are fiberglassed over, the air tank will be strapped to the top wall and the rudder pedals will be directly under it. To give the fiberglass a solid scaffolding to rest on while the epoxy resin dries, I cut two foam panels to fit the gaps I was going to cover and hot glued them in place. Once that was done, I tilted the hull on its side and began to add layers of fiberglass and soak them in resin. Unlike polyester resin, epoxy doesn't dissolve foam, which is very convenient. 
I let the resin cure overnight and sanded the walls next morning, and they came out pretty solid. They look pretty ugly right now, but don't worry, they'll be filled and painted once the sub is done. I took a break from bodywork for a little while to focus on the motor. This is a Newport brand 36 pound thrust saltwater trolling motor that I'll be using for propulsion, but, like the hull, it'll be heavily modified for underwater use. The first step in modifying the motor is to remove the head from it. Then there's a little bit of plumbing that has to be set up. Any trolling motor has some sort of shaft seal to prevent water from the outside from coming into the motor compartment. However, these motors are never more than a couple feet under the water when they're used on a boat, so the shaft seal never has to deal with more than, say, one or two psi of pressure differential. However, when we get down deeper in the water, the pressure rises very quickly, approximately one psi for every two feet. Actually, it's slightly less than that, but that number's a lot easier to remember. Anyway, suppose we were down past 120 feet the pressure would be 60 psi higher than that of the surface. That means if I had simply sealed off the top end of the trolling motor, there would be a 60 psi of pressure differential pushing against the seal that's only really meant for 1 or 2 psi. The water would most likely force its way in and ruin the motor. To solve this, I'm going to have to connect the motor compartment to a deformable bag, like a balloon. As the motor descends into deeper water, the pressure will increase, and because the bag isn't rigid, it'll contract and compress the air inside of it, which compresses the air inside of the motor compartment. This way, the pressure rise is compensated for, and there's no stress on the shaft seal, or really any part of the motor. To make the airbag connection, I'm going to attach this PVC elbow joint and run the motor wires out the corner of the elbow. The joint doesn't quite fit though, so I had to take my trusty grinder ball and increase the inner diameter a bit. Next I drilled the holes for the motor wires and pulled the wires through. This was a bit of a pain because the holes were a pretty tight fit. Then I was ready to connect the fitting to the trolling motor shaft with some two-part epoxy. Next I install a barb fitting on the threaded portion of the elbow. The threads will also get epoxy to ensure a good seal. Now I need to ensure the wire pass-through is totally pressure tight, so I'm going to install this 3D printed dam over the pass-through which will be filled with flex seal to pot the wires. I found that I have to use a syringe to collect and inject flex seal. If I try to pour it, it gets all over everything and most of it gets wasted. The joint looks a little sloppy, but once the rubber dries, any excess or ooze can just be peeled off. The last thing I did was glue on a little strain relief clip. This ensures that any bending stress on the wires is being taken up by the clip and not flexing the rubber seal back and forth, which would damage it over time. Next I need something to mount the motor bracket onto, so I cut this plywood plate and fiberglass over it, and then on top of it I'll attach this 2x4 to serve as the mounting block for the bracket. Seems to fit pretty well, so I'll go ahead and fiberglass this mount on the back of the kayak. I fiberglassed yet another plywood board to serve as the tray that the battery would be mounted to. Next I made a cutout to the left of the seat where the throttle switch will be mounted. I made yet another piece of fiberglass plywood for it to connect to, and then I glued it onto the kayak with two-part epoxy. In all the locations where epoxy is applied, I'm scuffing the surface with 60 grit sandpaper and then torching it as I showed earlier. Next came the pieces for the rudder pedals. This mounting block will be glassed onto the hull, and this block that has the pivot bolt will be screwed onto the mounting block. I'm using an epoxy resin with a very low viscosity, so it tends to seep out of the fiberglass and go everywhere. Luckily, since it's flowing into the parts of the hull that haven't been scuffed or torched, when it cures, I can just peel it clean off. While I waited for the resin to cure up front, I started installing the eye bolts for the rigging in the back. 
the stock footrests were going to get in the way of the rudder pedals, so those had to be removed. Everything was now in place to mount the motor and start connecting the rigging for steering control. I placed a temporary cap where the pressure equalization bag will be connected later for diving. The rudder pedals were built from PVC since they're not really going to have a huge load on them. They looked a hell of a lot nicer once they were painted and connected to the pivot. Now that I had run the rigging lines from the rudder pedals, I needed something to connect them to on the motor. To do this, I 3D printed this control horn to clamp onto the trolling motor shaft and sandwiched it in layers of fiberglass to make it solid. Let's try the rudder pedals now. Works perfectly, that's one big item out of the way. I thought I was finished with bodywork, but on closer inspection it turned out that this section of the nose was intruding on the air tank's mounting space, so I had to cut it out and glass back over the area. Once that was taken care of, it was time to find a home for all the electronics. Between the seat and the battery seemed like a natural choice for the bilge pump. I tried to make sure it was situated in the lowest position possible, but in the future it might be necessary to create a sump in the hull so that I can collect as much water as possible with it. Then I printed these corner stops to screw onto the battery tray to keep the battery from shifting around. Then I sealed off the battery cell vents to ensure the battery was totally hermetically sealed against water. Now if you don't know what you're doing, I don't advise doing this. Under normal operation, an AGM lead acid battery shouldn't vent any gas, but if you charge or discharge too rapidly, or charge beyond the maximum voltage, an excess of hydrogen gas will build up, and if it has nowhere to go, it can cause the battery to bulge and possibly even rupture, which is pretty dangerous. Once the vents were sealed off, I placed 3D printed dams around the terminals, connected my power cables, and sealed those off as well. Let's take a closer look at the throttle switch I mentioned earlier. This is a heavy duty two position spring loaded switch that I'll use to control the motor speed. There's actually no need to have a heavy duty switch because it's just producing a very low current signal, but this one came with a thick rubber boot which I want for sealing it underwater. It's housed inside a PVC cap and I potted the switch boot and wire pass throughs with a bunch of flex seal. I was going to build a whole bracket around the PVC fitting so I could screw it into the kayak mount, but I got lazy and just glued it on. Then I sealed up another switch with flex seal, this time for the bilge pump. The last major electronic component needed before I can get moving is the speed controller for the motor. This is a brushed motor speed controller that's rated for 60 amps, which actually seems a little surprising considering how small it is. The speed controller will live inside of a sealed tube filled with mineral oil. The walls of the tube are thin aluminum, so heat can easily transfer to the water outside. A barb fitting is installed at one end so that the tube can be filled with oil via a silicone tube connected to a funnel. Here's the finished product. The enclosure is filled with oil and the silicone tube is pinched off with zip ties to seal it shut. The last part of the speed control is an Arduino board with a simple program that converts the two discrete inputs to PWM throttle commands. 
seems to work perfectly, so I secured my battery, potted the Arduino board, and did a quick and dirty test on the actual trolling motor to make sure everything was still fine. Okay, working exactly as planned, so that's a relief. I used the same basic setup in my original submarine for motor control and it worked really well for me. Here's a quick explanation of how it works. The ESC output leads connect to the trolling motor and the input leads are connected to the 12 volt battery. Now here's where a little bit of programming is involved. The signal to drive the ESC is actually generated by an Arduino board based on discrete signals it gets from the throttle stick. There's no analog range here, it's simply two on off states. The program in the Arduino, which I'll add a link to in the description, converts the discrete inputs into a pulse width modulation output, which is the same format an ESC would typically receive from a remote control receiver. Here's a basic schematic showing the setup of the pins on the throttle switch. They're pulled high with resistors until one of the throttle states is engaged, pulling the Arduino pin to ground, which is considered a high state in the program. Holding the switch down will bring the throttle up to maximum in about 3 seconds for either direction. Engaging the stick in the opposite direction for about half a second will zero out the throttle, and continuing to hold the stick down in that direction will start ramping up the motor again. Alright, let's actually try it out in water. The kayak floats and doesn't leak, so that's step one. My only concern is that without the tank in the front, it's pretty tail heavy. The tail heavy problem became even more obvious when I bumped the kayak against the edge of the pool and the tail dipped into the water enough to take on water and sink the boat. Now obviously this is a submarine project so everything was already waterproofed, but that doesn't mean I want to dive prematurely. Basically what just happened was that the excess weight in the back brought the back of the kayak dangerously close to the waterline. When it bumped the edge of the pool, it pitched up just enough to dip that open section below the water, took on water, and then sank. When the scuba tank is installed up front, it'll balance out this issue, but more importantly, this big open section on the back needs to be covered up. Kayaks are low profile hulls, so they need to be covered to avoid taking on water from a stray wave and so forth. Some even have seals around the occupant to eliminate any water entry. So that's it for part one of this series. In the next part, I'll do some testing out in real water, build a ballast control system, rig up hydrofoils as dive planes, and then do some test dives in my pool. Thanks for watching.